and welcome back um, to the presentations that I do here at the Salt Marsh. If you haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, there are 70 of us, with the biggest firm outside of Boston. Um, there are 40, or, uh, 40 in Worcester, 20 in Westboro, where I am, around 495, and then 10 in Boston. Because there are so many of us, everybody gets to do what they like doing, which is what I like about being there. So I don't have to try to figure out everything in the world, just this little piece of the world. And so my piece is elder law, um, which is really about helping folks from the point pretty much when they're retiring, kind of like, like my friends Frank and Mary, if, if they're like 70, from, the, from 65 or 70, I have no clients under 55. My median client age is 74. So usually these presentations have been about very, I wanna say more specific legal issues, but I wanted to do something a little different this fall. So I'm doing two presentations in which I'm trying to do this, I hate the term, but more holistically, right? Because um, I really want you to think about my friends Frank and Mary, and you've all heard of them if you've been here before, Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and their goal is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. So that's the goal. Okay. And, then, and so the question is, how do you do that if you're on Nantucket? So um, I wanted to start off, uh, first of all, I have a guest, my friend Erin Kopecki, uh, who I met several years ago. She's going to be talking to you about what a geriatric care manager is and what they do because that person plays a really crucial role in a lot of the work that I do. I'm constantly, when folks speak to me about what they think are just their legal issues, they say, you know, you really need to look at this a little more globally, and that's why you need to talk to a geriatric care manager. It's not that I'm picking and choosing among geriatric care managers here. She's the only one. When I was here four or five years ago, there was nobody, right? I do this, a lot of this work on, on the other island that can't be named, and there's one great person over there and I was always hoping that a person would show up here. So it did, she did. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Frank and Mary. So, Excuse me, do you work independently? So, yes. she's, so she, she's here, she's on island. She's even got a fiance and they're getting married. Did, did, no, is it just a fiance? Do we have a fiance, date? Fiance, no date yet. Well, no date, <laughs> right? So she's totally gone native here. You know, she's not from here originally, but she's, she's kind of bought in. So. Um, I decided to, instead of talking about Frank and Mary at 80, to talk to them, to talk about them when they were 70. So they're a little bit younger. Um, and Frank has just kind of retired, and so is Mary, and they're trying to figure out the rest of their lives. But they're relatively healthy. And if Frank and Mary right now, we're going to assume, because they're on Nantucket, that their house is a, is a modest house, so it's only worth $800,000. Um, they have savings of 300 and Frank has an IRA of 200. So they have a total assets of about a million three. Uh, but, but they don't have a lot of income. Frank's living on social security and, they're, and, and Mary's got social security. They derive some money from their investments and stuff. But they're basically okay. You know, they got no mortgage and they're kind of doing okay. Um, and Frank, at this point, based on all of the data, has an actuarial life expectancy of 14.4 years. And Mary has a life expectancy of 16.57 years. Now, the reason why I bring these up is that there is a, a part of the reason why I'm doing these presentations this year this way is as part of a broader effort to try to get folks, help folks, think about the rest of their lives. Think about their life from the perspective of the rest of their lives as opposed to kind of where they were. Because if you're 70, that means that you really did live for 70 years. I am, by the way, going to be 70 in January. Maybe this is why I was doing this presentation. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited. So, so it's easy to think about, oh, I can't do what I did when I was such and such, you know, and oh, blah, blah. But, who, but what difference does it make? It's gone. Those years are just gone. The real question is about those, the rest of those years, you know, 15 or 16 years, that you're, that you're kind of, there's a good chance you could be around for this. So the question really is, how are those years gonna go, right? And I know that you, you don't wanna kind of be thinking about the end, right? Although that's what the second seminar is going to be about. We're gonna talk about Mary when she's 90 and Frank has died, and we're gonna be talking about her with more serious illness in terms of what kind of programs are available, but also in terms of trying to make the last year of your life as good as it can be. Because everybody has a last year of their life. Some people don't know that it's their last year until oh, just the very last day of that last year. Most people today know at 
well ahead of time because nobody drops dead anymore. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. So, the, but so the question is, you know, what what should they be thinking about? And so, I and and so there were really the question from Frank and Mary. Now they're retired and they've now they're sitting on the bench. And the question is, what are the reasons to get off the bench, right? Because they're past the point where they're like not tired. You know, oh, it's great, it's so relaxing. But now that's over. So the question is, how does the rest of their life go? So there were really three things that I would suggest that, that Frank and Mary need to do. One is um, they need to go to the Salt Marsh. They need to come to the Senior Center and get a sense of what the programs are that are available um, right here, because there were like a whole bunch. The second is they should know what a, who a geriatric care manager is and kind of connect with them. And they should talk to the ASAP. They should talk to the Sherry Hunt, the person who here is the person from Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands. Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands is the regional entity, one of 26 across the state. Every regional entity covers a piece of the state. They don't compete with each other. They're all nonprofits. They are the vehicle through which all federal and state money for seniors comes. So you really need to know them. Sherry, as promised, she'll be here for the second presentation. She has a family you know, issue and she's actually not, not around. She's, she's, there's somebody that's got some sickness. So, so she's not here today. But I'm going to talk about a little bit about what those programs are because I'm familiar with them. Um, the point of the Senior Center, as you all know, is that it's, there are a lot of reasons to come here. There is fun and games. There is food. I saw folks eating here just a few hours ago, as a matter of fact. That happens all the time. That was, by the way, the origin of the ASAPs, of those Aging Services Access Points, Elder Services, was the Older Americans Act, created by Lyndon Johnson, that everybody in this room actually would remember, right? One of the great pieces of the great society. And the original program that he did was Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels has been going for almost 50 years. That's pretty amazing. I'm going to answer all. What does ASAP stand for? Aging Services Access Point. ASAP. So the state, to replicate what the federal government had done, set up a, a system where they've divided the state into regions. Many other states have done that. And then federally, the state is divided into regions. Bureaucratically, Massachusetts is the only state where those match up. Every place else, you've got these, these things called, in federal league, they're called AAAs, Area Agencies on Aging. Triple A's, they call them. And they divide up states in one way. And then they've got, you've got the, the state that divides its own state up in a different way. And so there's all of this people at cross purposes. But here, it's all consistent, right? Which is really great. It's really, really good. So the main thing to think about if, you're, if you are young and healthy, and I'm just using 70 as an arbitrary number, meaning young and healthy, because I still feel good, right? Is, is volunteering, is volunteering, because that a key piece of, of aging is realizing that we kind of need to all be in this together. We, like the people who are we, right? Because our kids are all working all the time, and most of them don't live around here, right? They're living far away, taking care of their dog. Used to be grandchildren, now they're all dogs, you know, but I just had my first grandchild three weeks ago. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. So, volunteering, um, finding the resources, they talk regularly with Sherry. Right? So if there are people that need stuff, then she'll get you to Sherry. Um, and help with stuff. I, they have a, you have a great veterans agent whose office is right here and who's great at talking to you about this stuff. So the senior center is a big deal. But then there's the GCM. So I wanted Erin to come and talk to you about this because I can't explain it. All I can tell you is this is just a crucial role. It's, it's, Every community needs GCMs. We have, there are several in, in, back at home at the corner of, I live at the corner of 290 and 495. So there are, there are more there. I'm so delighted that there's somebody who is focusing on this, and that's why I asked uh, Aaron to talk. So we're talking about Frank and Mary now at 70. We're then going to talk about Frank and Mary at 80. Um, but I wanted Aaron to really kind of give you a sense of what, of what a geriatric care manager is, right? Totally, so you can see it's, it's related to 70 because you need to know them. It's really important at 80 because you really may, may be needing to figure out these services. Erin, and I just showed her this. So this is my high tech lesson. So that's forward okay. and that's backward. And, and that's everything I know. By the way, I just want to thank, before we start, Elvira Hardin, who was my first client in Nantucket. 
I started coming here about 10 or 11 years ago, and she actually had the bravery to hire somebody from off island to actually be her lawyer. And she, and she said she came today because she saw that I was doing a program. So thank you very much. You helped me build up my courage so that I, so that I could stay. So, thank you, thank you. Erin. All right, hi everyone. My name is Erin Kopecki, and I uh, founded Tucked in Elder Care. I started this aging life care management business a year and a half ago. And I'm here just to explain to you what I do as a care manager um, and how I can help my clients stay as independent as possible. Um, before I get into explaining uh, who a care manager is, I just wanted to point out an uh, interesting fact about the growing population. Um, care management, you may not be familiar with the term now, but it is a rising field because we're all living longer and the US population is growing um, exponentially. And they say that 10,000 baby boomers will turn 65 every day in the next 15 years. So that just goes to show you that it's wonderful that we're living longer, but we need to really make sure that we have the support and services available for our seniors to live a happy and healthy and high quality life. So who are we? Um, care managers, we come from all different backgrounds, but we all share the expertise in working with the aging population. Uh, personally, I come from the gerontology background. I went to undergrad and grad school for gerontology and management. Uh, and I came out as a gerontologist, which is a fancy term for someone who studies aging. I also am a licensed nursing home administrator. Some of you may know me from my previous role as the assistant administrator at Our Island Home. Um, and I am a certified geriatric care manager, and I'm also an Alzheimer's uh, association volunteer on island, so I help families and um, their loved ones who live with this disease. Um, and here's just some areas of expertise that care managers have. We deal with anything from uh, advocacy to crisis intervention, education on senior communities, uh, dealing with insurances, uh, helping clients apply for entitlement programs, and so much more. Uh, so quickly, I just wanted to touch base on care management versus case management, because uh, oftentimes it gets confused, and we do both uh, the care manager and the case manager do help our clients. Uh, but for case management, it's um, much more on a smaller level. They focus on the medical model, and they focus on that episode of care for their patient. They also uh, have an institutional allegiance. So they usually are working within a hospital or a rehab facility. Uh, for example, if your loved one were to uh, have a fall in the home and they, were, uh, they went to the ER, that case manager, their main goal is to make sure that that patient returns safely to home or safely to a nursing home. And then they step back and their um, job has been accomplished. But as for a care manager, we focus on the client holistically. Um, of course, the medical side of our client is very important, but there's so much more to a person than just the medical um, needs. Uh, our allegiance is only to the family and client. We are working for you. We're not working for anybody else. Um, you are, our client is our main priority. Um, and we do like to be proactive. Um, I oftentimes tell my clients, a lot of times families call me in a reactive situation. There's a crisis or emergency and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to navigate through the aging process. Um, luckily, I do have some families who are more proactive and I always say it's never too early to start working with a care manager um, and start working for proactive aging because um, it's only gonna make our loved ones uh, or yourselves live a positive aging life. Um, I think I'm gonna stop here and then say, I can, I'll do a little bit more and then I'm gonna go back to Arthur. Um, All right, and then we'll pick it up. After yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what does a care manager do? It's, when somebody asks me this, it's very difficult to explain it in simple terms because we do so much. All of our clients have such different needs and aging goals. Um, so I was really thinking about how to simply explain it and the best, way I could come up with it is saying that we are a concierge or a consultant for growing older. Um, we engage with our client and we're with them through the aging process. Um, and we also, oftentimes when I work with families, I mention to them that we are a family surrogate um, member 
we act as their daughter may act. We wanna take on all of that responsibility off of the family caregivers. Um, I'm sure some of you have been in that position before and it's a lot of stress and it's very overwhelming and burdensome. So we really, like one of my main goals is to allow the families to maintain that child-parent relationship, which is oftentimes lost when the roles reverse and their children start taking care of their parents. Um, it's so important for me and one of my main goals is for um, the families to, the family and client to have a high quality of life and um, it's really important to allow them to uh, create positive memories and experiences with their family. Want me to pick it up? Okay. Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted, yep, I wanted Erin to go, go through that because I bet a lot of folks kind of have never even heard of the term geriatric care manager. And, and when I describe to my clients what they do, I, I, t I say, well, like, they just kind of do everything. They help you figure it out because the, the biggest difficulty as you, as you get older in dealing with any kind of government programs, dealing with health issues, is that as you all know, the system isn't a system. It's all these like little pieces and there's programs here and programs there and there's nobody to help you figure it out and everybody's got skin in the game. You know, everybody that you're talking to is, is in, or many of them are all making money and they're all, and sometimes that's competitive and what you really want as you're kind of figuring all this stuff out, and we're gonna talk about this more when Frank and Mary are 80, is somebody to just help, who is just working for you, and somebody who's just trying to help you figure it out. I, it's kind of, the, it's the kind of senior version of kind of, I think what a lawyer is really supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to be kind of on your lawyer because he's gonna help you try to figure out how to get through all of this other stuff. So anyway, I'm gonna go through her slides there because she may come back to them. Uh, I'm gonna tell you that the other person that Frank and Mary need to meet, not when there's a crisis, but when they hit 70, right, is Sherry Hunt. You should just give her a call. If, if the, one of the reasons is you can talk to her, she'll come to your house. I mean, this is a very, everybody's really local here, right? So Sherry from Aging Services of Cape Cod and the Islands, uh, who, and they are located right at I'm losing it. The building, the, 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 the senior landmark housing, landmark, landmark house. house, landmark house. Their offices are in, the, she's in the basement at landmark house. But you don't have to go see her, she'll come and see you. And she's been here for a long time. And she can, first of all, tell you what all of the various programs are that they have, what the volunteer opportunities are that they have because they want folks to be volunteering, right? And what, if, what programs they have that you might be interested in. The, the ASAP sponsors a lot of educational programs. The ASAP actually provides the money for Meals on Wheels, provides the money for most stuff, right? And after, once you've talked to her, then you're gonna be like in their system. Like they're gonna know, she's gonna know that you exist and have some background. So if there is an emergency, now it's a lot easier for her to be dealing with any of these issues, okay? So now I just want to talk a little bit about law. If, if, you're, if you're Frank and Mary and you're, and you're 70, really, well, you may have, because it's the vineyard, or excuse me, because it's Nantucket, you may have an, an issue. If it weren't that it's Nant were Nantucket and therefore your house was worth so much, right? I often talk to folks who are Frank and Mary who are at 70 and I'll say, well, you know, it, you, typically their major issue is they're not worried about nursing home issues yet. And so they're not worried about doing that kind of mass health related planning. They wanna make sure that, that if something happens, that it, nobody has to go through the probate process. Why is that? Because the probate process is just cumbersome, right? If you die, own, and the way to avoid probate is to not own an asset in just your name the moment that you die. Uh, it, something which has a title to it, like a car, or a house, or a bank account that's just in your name, because if you do, then when you die, somebody has to figure out who gets that, who gets the property. And, and that's the purpose of the probate process is to figure that out. If you've got a will, then the will is gonna say where everything goes. If you don't have a will, contrary to a lot of kind of myth, nothing ever goes to the state. Nothing ever, ever goes to the state, right? If there is a relative and you have money, that relative will find you when you're dead. They will, it just happens, right? Um, the, the issue though, is, but in, if you don't have a will, the assets simply get divided according to the rules of intestacy. Um, the rules of intestacy are, are very clear. If one of you dies, if you're Frank and Mary and Frank dies and, they, and he's got a wife and kids, 
the wife gets everything. And if the wife is dead, the kids get everything, right? And that's the rules of intestacy, right? So if you want something different to happen, well, then you need a will. But otherwise, uh, for many folks like Frank and Mary, they simply own everything jointly. And the legal effect of a, owning it jointly is, is each of you, as a joint owner, owns 100% of the things that you own jointly. So when one of you dies, that person's interest just evaporates, and the other person becomes the sole owner. So if your spouse has died and you own the house together, you're simply the owner of the house. You don't have to do a new deed, none of that stuff. What you do need to do is record a death certificate in the registry so that the world can know that you're now the sole owner. You'd also need to file a tax affidavit so that the world can know that there's no estate tax that's owed as a result of your husband's death, because when your husband died, there was instantly a lien that was put on your house as a statutory lien to make sure the estate tax gets paid. But other than that, you, you become like the instant owner. So for many folks, that's not the issue. The only, the, there, there are two times only if, that Frank and Mary would have an issue. One, once again, if you're on Nantucket, and therefore, your assets are, because of the house, end up being worth, I think I said, a million two, right? Um, then, then, if, then if one of you dies and leaves everything to the second one, there's no estate tax because the amount that you leave to your spouse gets subtracted from the taxable estate. If the second person dies the next day, however, there is an estate tax. And, the est and there's always an estate tax if the estate is more than a million dollars. And the estate it tax in that case in the state of a million two would be around sixty thousand dollars now that's not nothing that's not nothing right but it's not gigantic however if you wanted to avoid that and 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 i often have clients i'll you mention to clients i've yet to find anybody that in their will they said i really want to leave some money to the department of revenue i mean they've been so good to me you know it's been a wonderful ride here in the commonwealth so it is a rel relatively simple way to avoid that, and that is the way that you do that is that you make sure that you have either a will or a trust that specifies that when the first of the two of you dies, some of the money, if Frank dies first, some of the money that was going to go to Mary instead goes in trust for Mary's benefit. And in that particular case, Mary can actually be the trustee of that trust and can be able to use any of that money. But as long as the amount of money that is in the trust or that goes into the trust is less than a million dollars. There's no one, there's no estate tax when the first spouse dies because the, there is no estate tax if your estate is below a million dollars. But that money that is in the trust when the second spouse dies, if it's still in trust, is not part of the second spouse's assets and therefore keeps the second spouse's assets below a million dollars. So through this miracle, of, of having these documents in place before the first spouse dies, you can eliminate the estate tax. But if that's not an issue, and the issue is just probate avoidance, then it's really simple. You just hold everything jointly, right? The only other issue is this uh, the asset protection, and I'm gonna talk about that more when Frank and Mary get to be 80. But the main thing, if you are, if you are 70 and you're Frank and Mary, is making sure that you're keeping control of your life while you're alive. Because, you know, ultimately, after you're dead, you're dead, and you don't really care about any of this stuff. There's a lot of theories about what happens after you die, and none of them do you really care about what, you're at, what happened to your assets after you're dead. So the two things you really have to have, uh, and, and this is kind of related to this slide. Uh, I regularly talk to clients who, like their, me, grew up in a time when, when people just died. You know, you, people just died. People, you had, somebody had a heart attack and they died, right? Or they, had a, or they had a stroke and they died. And it just seems like that doesn't happen that much anymore, anecdotally. And then I saw this statistic that in 1970, if you had a heart attack, your chances of being dead, or a heart attack or a stroke, your chances of being dead within 14 days were 33%. Today, they're 3%, or in 2010, it's probably lower now. That's the difference. So for, for a lot of folks who were, were thinking that they needed to be doing some planning because they were just going to drop dead, the likelihood of that now is really very small. So the two things that you really have to have are very simple and they're cheap, right? This is not a big, expensive legal thing. You need a power of attorney. Raise your hand if you have a power of attorney. That's great. That's great. Just about everybody has a power of attorney. You have to have it so that if you're incapacitated, somebody can handle your financial affairs. The only thing I would mention about that power of attorney is, first, 
You want to make sure that it contains a provision for unlimited gifting, if you are Frank and Mary, or if you really trust the person that you've named your attorney, which typically people do. The reason for that is, if there is an emergency, and if for, uh, well, I'll, gi I'll give you the nursing home case, the classic nursing home case. Frank and Mary, if Frank needed to go to a nursing home today, um, and, 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 and would be there for a long time, he could quickly qualify for MassHealth, the Massachusetts name for the, for the Medicaid program. Why is that? Because while Frank, in order to qualify, has to show that he has less than $2,000 in countable assets, his spouse can own the home no matter what the value. Every house on Nantucket can be kept, kept by the other spouse, and the six spouse can qualify for MassHealth. The, 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 the healthy spouse can also have up to $126,420 in other assets and can have unlimited income. So at any time, if Frank were, were, had a stroke and, and, and you know, weren't, didn't die, but was just going to be living for a long time, all these assets could simply be shifted to Mary at the last minute. There's no look back period or anything. And then the next day, and then in, in that case, the house would be safe. Mary could keep up to 100,000, say $100,000 in assets. She can keep actually 126,420, but who's counting? So she would keep 100. She could use the rest of the money to buy an annuity, thereby converting her accountable asset into a non-countable income stream. And the day after she bought that annuity, Frank would be eligible for Mass Health. So while Frank and Mary are both alive, there's no issue dealing with Mass Health unless there's no power of attorney from Frank to Mary. Because if there's no power of attorney, then Frank can't transfer his house interest to Mary at the last minute. Uh, and if there are other assets that he had in just his own name, he can't transfer them to Mary either, right? And even if there is a power of attorney, if the power of attorney limits the power of the attorney to make gifts to herself or to himself, then that transaction can't happen. So I would urge you if you have a power of attorney, which you all just about do, go read it and make sure, especially if it's an older power of attorney, because many of the older power of attorneys were designed to really limit the amount of gifting and make sure that it allows a gift to you if you're the spouse or if you're the child because you've got a parent that's done this and you're the lucky designated daughter or son, right? To make sure that this gifting can be made because otherwise Frank won't be able to qualify at the last minute. The other thing you want to make sure in there is, there's, is that there's an alternate. Typically, if you're Frank and Mary, you'll name each other as your attorneys. And many people don't go beyond that, right? You need to name one of your kids as an alternate, or many of your kids. You can actually name many of them jointly and jointly. You need to name at least one of them as an alternate so that if one of you gets sick and the other one doesn't feel like dealing with all the bank issues but just wants to be your wife, or your husband and with and be with you somebody else can do all that stuff like your the designated uh, daughter or son regarding the health care proxy once again you just frank and mary need to name an alternate typically they've always named each other to make medical decisions for them but you want to make sure that there's somebody else okay so those are the only things they really need to do so now we're going to talk a little bit about frank and mary at 80. so the reason why i did that earlier frank and mary slide was that that so many people kept saying you know, we, you never talk about Frank and Mary younger because this was the basic, this is my old Frank and Mary. So say Frank and Mary are 80. So now, they're still, their life expectancy has shrunk. Now, it hasn't shrunk by the number of years that just went by, right? Because 10 years just went by and before their life expectancy was about 15 years. And now at 80, Frank's is a, a little bit more than eight years and Mary's is a little bit more than nine years. Because every week, year that you live by virtue of living, your life expectancy doesn't shrink by that year, it shrinks by a smaller amount. So Frank and Mary have still got, you know, at least as far as the general population is concerned, quite a few years left. But there's less, but there's less. And so this is the point at which Frank and Mary wanna be thinking a little bit more about, about what's coming, um, but also wanna be trying to stay independent even though Mary may have some issues or Frank may have some issues. And so there are a set of different kinds of things that you want to be thinking about at that point. And for all of these, you probably want to be talking to a geriatric care manager, right? You want to be looking at your house and you want to be saying, so 
So I'm still okay in my house, right? I'm still, but you know, I don't, I want to be, I want to be really okay. Like I can still kind of get up the steps or I'm still, I'm not falling in the kitchen very much, you know, um, but there are, but there may be a whole set of things that you can do to adapt your house in order to make sure that you stay safe in your house. And I always tell clients, I said, you know, you can live to a very old age. Just don't fall. Just don't fall, right? Because you start falling, it, you, somebody break a hip, there's just trouble, right? But you can design for that. And if you're 80 and you want to be staying in your house, you need to be dealing with the stairs, you need to be dealing with a whole bunch of things, but you want some third party, thir some other set of eyes to look at your house because you're never going to take advice from your kids when they tell you that you're going to do these repairs. Never, never, because they're still your kids and you still think they're 10 years old, right? And that's okay, you know, but you, so you want to have somebody that you can talk to about that stuff. You want to see if there's some assistance that you want at home, right? And I know you just die because you think about, well, wait, I can take care of my own house, right? I can take care of my own house. But do you really want to take care of it? You know, do you really want to do all the crummy jobs? Do you really want to wash? My wife yesterday said, this is the last year I'm washing the windows. She was washing the windows. She said, I don't, I'm reaching, I'm doing all this. Why is she still washing the windows? You know, I mean, you know, it, it, it's obviously you got to pay for that. And you, you hate to think of paying for this stuff because you always did. But you, it, so, so the question is, do you need assistance? And if you need assistance in the home, so who do you call? There isn't like an automatic list. There isn't like a yellow pages. That's the point of a geriatric care manager, is the geriatric care manager who is good is going to know all of the home care agencies, a lot of the individual home care people who are just kind of doing this stuff, what the other kinds of things are that are available in the community. You know, so that, that's the point, right? And are you still OK at home? Are you still OK at home? Or do you need to consider another living arrangement? That's the point of assisted living. Now, if you're staying on island, it's, it's not hard to shop that because there's only one, right? There's only Sherburn Commons, the, 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 the kind of true assisted living. Um, but you may want to look at that. You may want to look at the place whose name always escapes me, the place on Main Street. Homestead. The Homestead. The homestead, actually a wonderful place, a wonderful. I really like, except, you know, they got stairs, you know, they, but they've got, a, they've got a, a, one of the, the, the devices that get you up the stairs and stuff, right? Yes, but you want to kind of know about what those options are. Uh, and that's the reason why you want to talk to the geriatric care manager. So now you can go back to your slides because you're very technologically savvy and can figure that out. And then I'll talk a little bit about the legal issues from there. Okay, so before I can start making recommendations uh, for any of my clients, I did want to just briefly mention that after, uh, you, it's usually a family member, but after a family member or a client calls me with a problem and they're looking for me to come up with a solution, uh, my first um, task is to go into the home or go into the, they may be in the hospital as well, depending on the situation at hand, and I provide a comprehensive assessment. I get to learn the client as much as possible and I evaluate them holistically. Um, and then I take all that information and I uh, gather it all and compile it into a very detailed care plan. Um, and so that care plan, it acts as a roadmap and it allows the family and the client to navigate through the aging process. Um, it identifies the needs um, of that client and identifies their goals. It also identifies any concerns or um, issues that I noticed during the assessment. And then it provides resources and services to meet those needs and goals, along with all my recommendations. Um, and so having handing that care plan to the family, it gives them the opportunity to use it as they see fit. Um, and I can step back, or they are welcome to allow me to help and implement those recommendations. So of course, there are uh, so many reasons as to why someone may need a geriatric care manager. Um, I have a lot of examples on that, but since today is about staying independent, I wanted to give some examples of how I help my current clients stay independent. Um, on Nantucket, a lot of our, the senior population, they have, if, they've, if they grew up here or if they summered here and then retired here, their plan was to age in place in their Nantucket home. Um, they don't want to, just because they're getting older, they don't want to move 
closer to their daughter in New York or their son in D.C. Um, and they shouldn't have to. If that's their goal to age in place on Nantucket, using a, a geriatric care manager and acting as a, a surrogate family member, we can allow that goal to happen. Um, I currently have a client right now who has um, about five daughters and sons all throughout the um, country, but sh her goal was to remain on, on Nantucket. Um, so I help with uh, providing wellness checks. I provide ongoing communication to the family. I speak to them multiple times during the week. I accompany her to doctor's appointments and make sure that that information that um, is at that doctor's appointment gets back to the children so they're involved as much as possible. Um, and with my involvement with this client, unfortunately, I've, I made recommendations in the way beginning that some of them, she wasn't ready. She wasn't ready to wear a lifeline because they're not the most flattering, but they also are um, very important to help you remain independent. Um, she also didn't want to use um, a walker. So unfortunately, within the past three months, she had two falls, which is a big red flag. And we really want to make sure that she achieves that goal of living in her Nantucket home. Um, so as the surrogate family member geriatric care manager, I was able to uh, set up a lifeline for her and provide services, provide somebody to help with the grocery shopping and the housekeeping and laundry. Um, we aren't taking away her independence. If anything, we're just making her more independent um, and keeping her safer at home. Um, another example as well is uh, simply medication management. As we get older, we start taking more medications and sometimes we forget to take them. I know I do that myself. Um, and just having a nurse go out and provide that medication management, um, it also allows for providing companionship to that client and it's also another set of eyes. Um, and one wrong, uh, missing a medication or doubling up on a medication can lead to so many other things, um, more so negative than positive. Um, so it's always good to be proactive about that and put services in place in order to allow our clients to remain as independent as possible. Uh, so I work with a geriatric care manager. Um, of course, aging is inevitable. We're all sitting here today and we are aging as we speak. Um, and it's not easy. And I'm sure many of you have learned to realize that the aging process is so complicated. You think, you're, you retire and it's rainbows and butterflies, um, but unfortunately life gets a little more difficult, um, it seems. And just to have somebody knowing that there's somebody there to support you, to advocate for you, that you can lean on and that you can trust, um, it can really help uh, with your aging process and make it a more positive one. Um, that's why I strongly recommend people to start uh, reaching out and building relationships and building their support group because if your support team knows you at your best and you can learn to trust them and they can learn to trust you, um, they're only gonna be able to care for you better as you age. Um, you guys can look at that. That's just kind of an overview of what we do as a care manager. Um, and the big question to end my part of this presentation is not what a care manager does, but how we can help you. You're in control of your aging process. Um, you're in the car seat. And it's all up to you to reach out and ask for help. And as a care manager, we're here to help you and your aging goals and achieve them, whether they're big or small. Thank you. You're going to have to flip back. So I was thinking about those golden, the golden years. I was talking, well, actually, one of, my, one of my partners has got, um, so he's 70 and, and his folks are older. And his father always says, the only thing golden about the golden years is the P. Now, I don't know if I can say that on camera now, but... But so, so, so now Frank and Mary at, oh, I see, yes. here I am. Sherry Hunt, at 80, if you need these kinds of services, there are a whole bunch of services that are, are provided with state funds that are not asset based. Many people think that, 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 that home care services, for example, you can never get them at home unless you're completely broke. That is not the case. Um, that that you, you will be charged a copay, which is based on your income. Um, and, and there is a maximum income figure, which Sherry can go over with you. But there are, home care, there are home care hours up to not a gigantic number of hours a week, but up to six or seven or eight hours a week 
that you can get through this state-funded program. Sherry can talk to you about that. It's a terrific program. To the extent that you need more extensive help at home, um, there is also a significant program um, called the Frail Elder Waiver Program, uh, which is also funded by, which is funded by MassHealth, and that program is asset-based. Asset and if you're Frank or Mary and you need a lot of help at home, um, and, and you, of course you want to stay at home, right? And you don't want to go, as I've said here many times, the Island Home is the greatest nursing home I've ever seen. I love the Island Home because the management, I think, it's a very friendly place. It's the right size. And so it's about, in terms of how much people want to go to a nursing home, people want to go there more than any other nursing home I've seen. However, that said, no one's crazy about going to a nursing home. You really want to try to stay at home if you can. And that's where this Frail Elder Waiver Program comes in. So I want to talk about that a little bit in terms of qualifying. Um, so for, say, that, say that Frank and Mary are both still alive and those are their assets. So they've actually got a million three, uh, 800,000 and then the three and then the two. They've got a million three and that's their income. So for, and say that Mary uh, needs a lot of assistance at home uh, and so she's having a lot of problems. She can, she can qualify for the frail elder waiver because her income just her income from Social Security is below a magic number, which has been $2,250. It just went up by like $50 or something, $2,250 a month. All she has to show is that she has assets of less than $2,000. But, but all of the same rules that applied when I was talking about the nursing home before apply here. Mary, in that situation, if she needs a lot of care at home, can simply shift all of her assets to Frank. Now the house is not countable. These other assets, that other $500,000 is countable. He can keep, though, up to $126,420. He can take all the rest of the money and buy an annuity with it. And as long as the annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, and you saw that his actuarial life expectancy is about eight years, the buying of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So the day after Frank buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for these programs. So that's a big deal. The other thing that Mary should be aware of, you know, pay, paying for home care. If she, can, if she can get her doctor or a nurse or, a, or even a social worker to certify that she needs assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, and transferring. Transferring means getting up out of a chair, going across the room and sitting down. Not that she needs it all the time, but that she needs it on occasion. I've heard, I heard one nurse say, you know, if, so if you're having steak and somebody has to cut up your, the steak, that's needing assistance with eating, right, for example. So don't assume that you know that, what, what those things mean when you're kind of thinking about these programs. If somebody can, will certify that or say that you need to have somebody around a lot because you have memory issues, then all of the cost of all of those home care people that are coming in is tax deductible, right? That's especially relevant if you're Frank and you've got a large IRA that you've been not using because you didn't want to pull the money out because you didn't want to pay the taxes, right? Well, now all of a sudden, you're, if you use that money for that home care for your wife who's got those needs, you're using 100% of those dollars. You're not having to pay any of those dollars in income tax. Because all the dollars that you're taking as income, you're spending as a valid medical deduction. I didn't uh, think we could defer our IRAs. The question is, the, the, no, the, it is so the question. So, in, well, I'll, so the question is, uh, as this woman has said, you cannot defer. The, the, all that you cannot defer is the taking of the regular payment after your 70 and a half. You have to take the required minimum distribution, which is the amount that the IRS determines you need to be taking until you're 110. That's how they kind of figure out that number. But, the, but you can always take more than that, except that whether you take the required minimum distribution or you take more than that, you're paying income tax on that, right? Which is why typically people won't take more than their RMD, their required minimum distribution. But the point is, in this case, if you're taking the dollars out in order to spend them on that home care and either a doctor, nurse, or social worker will certify that you need that home care because you've got those issues, all those dollars are tax deductible. So every dollar you're taking out of your IRA, 
you're not paying income tax on it because the, the income is on, on this part of your tax return, but then you've got this huge medical deduction, right? So that's the, that's the notion. Um, so the, the frail elder waiver, that's what I was just talking about. The frail elder waiver, which is which if, if in Sherry Hunt's terms, and this is, this is the person you'd want to talk to about qualifying for the frail elder waiver, is Sherry Hunt, because the, the ASAP, among other things, is the gatekeeper for this program. Um, MassHealth will pay for, actually under the regulations, an unlimited number of home care hours, typically not more than 40 or 50 hours a week, but that's a lot, right? If you can, if, if in the opinion of Sherry Hunt, in the opinion of the ASAP, you meet these criteria, you either need assistance with two of the activities of daily living, or you need a lot of, you need a lot of supervision so that you can get care. So remember that program. Um, as, as I explained just now, right, Frank or Mary can qualify for that program anytime, anytime. There is, and the reason for that is that contrary to this kind of, this isn't a myth, it's just what you hear all the time, gifts to your spouse are not subject to the five-year look-back period. Whenever I start explaining in this, people keep thinking, but wait, isn't there a look-back period? Gifts to your spouse are not subject to the five-year look-back period. So Frank and Mary, in their situation when they're both alive, don't have to plan ahead in order to do all this stuff, because if somebody needs to qualify for mass health, they can shift all their assets at the last minute. Same thing with buying that annuity. Uh, people will tell me, well, I, but I hate annuities. They don't have a good return on investment. And I absolutely agree with you, which is why I tell people, you'd never want to buy an annuity like this ahead of time, right? If you bought the annuity that I just described, one that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that was shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and you called the annuity company and described what you wanted, they'd say, oh, you want a Medicaid qualifying annuity. That's why people buy them, to qualify for Medicaid, right? So, so the only, but, so, but you don't have to do that until the day before you're trying to qualify for mass health. Assisted living. So here's my pitch for Sherbin Commons, right? So many people in other assisted livings, but it's Sherbin Commons, right? And I really like Sherbin Commons. It's got a nice scale. I'm so excited about you're so fortunate that that place got saved and is now a nonprofit, and because it's locally controlled, it's thriving, right? So, but use these as estimated numbers. Say your cost in, monthly in the assisted living is $8,000 a month, right? And t say you're Frank and Mary, and your income is $3,000 a month from just Social Security, and just Social Security, right? So that means that their burn rate monthly is about $5,000 a month, right? And, 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 but, and, and that's about all it is, because if you go, once you've moved to assisted living, while you certainly can always find things to spend money on, if you don't want to, you really don't have to spend a lot of money once you're at Sherbin Commons. I mean, the food, I am told, and I've tried it, is very good, right? You've got, you can have your own car, in which case you have to maintain your car, but otherwise there's transportation. Moving to assisted living, the cost of the assisted living really needs to be it's, it, it's, it's never that much more, it, no, I shouldn't say it's never that much more. It is not as much more than living at home as you would expect once you add up the cost of living at home. But anyway, in this case, assume that Frank and Mary's burn rate is $5,000 a month or $60,000 a year. If their assets were $600,000 a year, that means they'd have enough money to stay in assisted living for 10 years. But of course, their assets aren't that. Their assets are a million three, right? Which means they've got enough money to go to assisted living for the rest of their lives, for the rest of their lives. So what, ma what makes Nantucket kind of unusual is that it's given folks who, don't, who otherwise don't have substantial assets the ability to assure that they can live in assisted living for the rest of their lives just because that extra asset is there, right? And I'll just mention one other thing, by the way, about the payments to assisted living. If your doctor says that that you need to be in the assisted living because you need assistance with two of the activities of daily living or you require constant supervision, right? And th then the entire assisted living monthly bill is tax deductible, which is of course is gigantic, you know? And once again, going back to Frank's, Frank's uh, using Frank's IRA, right? Or selling the house because chances are there's gonna be a big capital gain from selling the house, right? But all of these payments are tax deductible if the doctor will certify that. Um, so the reason why folks, 
I think more about these nursing home issues as they get older is that. Um, according to the Alzheimer's Association, if you're 65, your likelihood of having dementia and needing some nursing home care at some point is one in nine. If you're 85, it's one in three. Why is it, as I've said here before, because if you got sick with something else, at that point, you're dead, right? So the folks who are still there, still standing, are the folks who are you know, more likely to end up with dementia. So that's why Frank and Mary at 80 get more interested in also considering, well, what they can do. So what they can, so what they can do, first of all, I've already explained to you that if one of them needs nursing home care and the other one is alive, there really isn't an issue. So they don't have to do anything ahead of time. They don't have to give away all their assets and wait five years, they don't have to do any of that. However, if, if they have that simple estate plan that I told you about, that they typically have, which means they own everything jointly, so the estate plan is if one dies, the other one gets it. And so if Frank dies and Mary needs a nursing home, now she's got a problem, right? Because she's got this $800,000 house. She's got this, all this, she's got about $500,000 in cash, right? So now she's got to spend down all that cash to less than $2,000. And then she'll qualify for our island home, but, then, but then, then Mass Health will put a lien on her house in order to collect whatever they pay on her behalf while she's alive. It's a simple way to avoid that. If the issue is you just want to protect your spouse, and that is the most common thing I hear from people like Frank and Mary. They just want to make sure that if they die, their spouse is safe. They're not thinking about themselves. They want to make sure their spouse is safe. It's very simple. You have a will, and the will says, when I die, what would have gone to my spouse if she's still alive, or if he's still alive, instead goes in trust for the benefit of my spouse. And you can name, the spouse can't be the trustee, because the spouse can't have control. So you have to have, you have to have a trusted person, a, kid, a child, a somebody or other. It doesn't have to be a child, often a child. And if you structure things that way, then when the first person dies, whatever that person owns, remember, passes through their will, and therefore goes in trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse, and it's all safe. Everything's safe. Even if the assets didn't get into the hands of the first spouse to die until the day before the first spouse died. There's no look back period regarding any of this. So if you're Frank and Mary, you have the ability to, to set this up. And then what, what I always tell clients after they've done this is if you get sick, first call your doctor, then call me. And we can talk about how you want to restructure your assets. If you're sick because you have dementia and, it may, and you may be thinking about nursing home at some point, then we're going to shift everything to your spouse so that if your spouse dies, you're going to be safe. If you're sick and you have cancer and it looks like you may die soon, we're going to shift everything to you so that when you die, your spouse is going to be safe. The point is you can make all those decisions later. You just want to have the wills in place kind of ahead of time. So that is Frank and Mary at 70 and Frank and Mary at 80. Um, I want to really thank Erin Kopecky. Can I have a quick round of applause for my wonderful guest, Erin Kopecky? Thank you very much for coming. And I hope she's going to be back together with Sherry. And I'm, I'm hoping to get, I, I don't want to mention his name, because he's a wonderful doctor on the island and has said that he'll come to the next one, to talk about Mary at 90 and how to think about, you know, when you really, you really are getting more frail and to think about the, the last year of your life. Um, but in the meantime, once again, the purpose of all of my presentations is, is to help people sleep at night. If this is helping, this, if you're not worried about any of this, you don't have to worry about it. And one of my goals is to tell you that in many cases, you don't have to worry, right? But if you are worried about any of this, well, then you should talk to somebody. Thank you very much. We'll see you in a couple months. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Oh, anything. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, I'm sorry. We're back on. Questions. What is the uh, statutory exemption for the federal estate tax? Uh, what is the statutory exemption for the federal estate tax? Keeps going up, but it's now a little over $11 million. $11 million. That's right. That's right. Massachusetts has a and, and Massachusetts has the lowest statutory exemption of any state, a million dollars. A million dollars. That's correct. So that, so that you're really... Massachusetts, after your death, is not interested in, in gifts of anticipation... And, and, and Massachusetts, that is, and that, that's just what I was going to say. And Massachusetts does not care about, well, they do, but, they, but, but they don't statutorily have any right to care about it, gifts in anticipation of death. 
right? No. No. So that so I, one of the I things can't that I imagine that is uh, one of the policies of this day and age. One, one of the things that I tell all of my clients, and they're astonished to find out. I say, if you're single, right? If you're single, then your the, one of your real simple estate plans should be talk to your attorney, the the person with the power of attorney, and tell them, look, if I'm gonna die transfer everything out just give it away before i die and as long as it's done before i die it's not part of my taxable estate right and it just goes away and it just reduces your estate tax i was just talking to somebody about this yesterday so now once again there's a caveat right in that you don't want to inadvertently hurt hurt them on another front right so this particular person had she's her husband died a couple of years ago she's got a about a million six Right, so she's got real estate, a couple pieces of real estate worth about a million. Can we just, can you just close that door? She, we got, she got a couple pieces of real estate worth about a million. She's got a, a, he had an IRA worth a couple hundred thousand, right? Or she has, and now she has the IRA worth a couple hundred thousand, and then she's got 400,000 in cash. So I said, you don't want to give the house to your kids before you die, right? because then the tax basis of the house won't step up at the date of death value, to the date of death value. What you want to do is you want to deed them a remainder interest in the property, keep a life estate, deed a remainder interest in the property, that way you won't have to go through probate. You, you'll, it'll have to be in your estate for estate tax purposes, but the estate tax is much lower than the capital gains tax. The estate tax for a state of this kind of money is six, seven percent, Capital gains tax is 20%, federal and state put together, right? So you, want to, so you don't want to give away your house before you die, especially if it's Nantucket and you bought it when it was $300,000 and now it's a million five. Better to pay the estate tax in order to keep your kids from having to pay the capital gains tax. The other one is the tax deferred. You know, do you want to give away- well, Someone would only pay the taxes when they sell the property, right? And, 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 and as you correctly point out, the kids only pay the taxes when they sell the property. That's right. Except that the other benefit of them, of, of keeping the property, is that it steps up to the, if you keep it, it the, the, the so-called tax basis jumps to the date of death value. So if the kids don't sell the property, but they decide to rent it out, right? The new basis of that property for purposes of depreciation is the stepped up basis. So you suppose, I'll give you the example. You suppose you had a house, you bought it for $300,000. Now it's worth a million two. And you die and the kids keep it and they're renting out the house. Depreciation, federal and state, runs on real estate is, I want to say, 27 years. So you're depreciating about 4% of the house per year, right? So that's, that's free money, right? So you rent the house out but your income on the house is income minus expenses and depreciation. So the depreciation is kind of a make-believe number. You, you, you get to declare the depreciation even though, even though it's not really, an ex you didn't spend anything, right? So the depreciation on a house of a million two, that's 4% of a million two, it's about $45,000. So the first $45,000 in rent that they get if they keep the house is free. They don't pay any tax on it. It's tremendous, right? So you really want to keep the house. The other thing is you want to decide, do I want to pay the income tax on the money that I have in my 401k so that I can give it away early in order to avoid the estate tax? That's the trade. So in this case, I told my, I told my client, I said, what you want to do is you want to tell your, your attorney, give away the cash. If I die, give away the cash before I die, thereby shrinking her estate from a million six to a million two, and saving the tax on that $400,000. And she can give it away the day before she dies. Day before she dies. I know that was a long-winded answer, but I think you, yeah, I, 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 I'm really glad you brought that up, because that's really important. Yes, sir. So in the state of Massachusetts, it's a million dollar reduction. Yeah. But let's assume you had a million five state. Yeah. Do you pay state tax on the increment above the million, or once you go above the million, do you go back to zero? A quick history. The Massachusetts estate tax was created in the 1920s, about the same time the federal estate tax was created. And it, and it was created to provide for an estate tax on rich people. And rich people were defined at that time as people having more than $40,000. So at that time, they, they, they adopted a chart which said, first $40,000 is free, the next $50,000, the tax is 8 tenths of 1%, the next $100,000, the tax is like 1.6%, and it keeps going up. 
And looking at that chart, the tax, when you get to a million dollars around, right, is once you hit there, is about 6%, okay? And I mention that because that chart is still the law. That's the same chart we still use, okay? Except that over time, it turned out as a result of that chart that everybody that owned a house was paying an estate tax. And so in order to deal with that, the state said, what we'll do is we will, it, we will over increase the amount below which you don't have to pay the tax, right? And it went up to $100,000 at one time, then 500, then 600, then a million, and that's where it's been for like 20 years, right? But the question then always is, so what if you're over that line? Because the, and, the, and what happens if you're over the line, if you're over a million dollars, is you compute your estate tax two different ways. First, you use the chart, the same old chart, right? Then you say, what would be my tax if, I, if, if the tax were 40% of all the dollars over a million? 40%. Now remember, at that point, when you're in a million, the chart tax is only like 6%. So you're paying this huge differential on all those dollars until you catch up with the chart, right? So you always compute the two numbers and you pay the lower of the two. So if your estate is a million one dollar, you pay 40 cents. 40% 40 of all the dollars over a million, right? The place where, the, where they cross is about at a million one hundred twenty thousand dollars, at which point forty percent of all the dollars over a million becomes more than the chart, and therefore you're paying the chart. See so how that works? When do you get to sixteen percent rate? What size of state? Do you and when do you get to sixteen percent? Uh, about six million dollars. You get to sixteen percent. Okay, it ramps up fairly slowly. And that's the. Um that's the maximum you pay in the state of Massachusetts, 16%. That's the maximum amount, yeah, if I recall correctly. That's right. And it, that's why when it kicks in. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I was so long-winded. Thank you for that question, which I think was those two questions, which I think were really important. We'll see you in a, couple, a little while, and we're going to talk about Frank, or Mary at 90. Poor Frank died. Thank you very much. Thank you.